Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. Chapter 48, page 148. Who makes fun of anything where mention is made of Allah or the Quran or Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, commits disbelief. Okay, this, in alhamdulillah, in alhamdulillah, in ahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu, wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina, man yahdihillahu falamudilla lah, wa man yudlilhu falahadiya lah, وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. This is an extremely important chapter, a very important chapter. Everyone should pay attention here. It is an extremely important chapter to make fun of, to mock, to ridicule anything of the Quran or the Sunnah or the religion of Islam or the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. This is an act of kufr, an act of disbelief. Okay, this is very important because too many Muslims are guilty of it. Too many Muslims are guilty of it. Forget the non-Muslims, even the many of the Muslims, they make fun of something in the Quran or the Sunnah. Okay, either they they make fun of the Sunnah itself or they make fun of the Quran itself, and this is clear, open, blatant kufr. Okay, no one has an excuse for making fun of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or making fun of Allah or making fun of the Quran. There is no excuse here. Okay, or they make fun of something Islamic, such as salah or zakah. Or they might they might mimic you know wudu and make fun of wudu, okay? Or they might make fun of the beard or something that is Islamic or the hijab, okay? In this case, hmm? or even exa- no, it's definitely to make fun of the concept of four wives, to make fun of the concept of cutting the hand off or stoning the adulterer, to ridicule these concepts, okay? This case, in this case, this person might be guilty of kufr if he realizes that this thing is an Islamic custom or an Islamic practice. Then he makes fun of it despite that fact. Then this is a type of kufr. Now the question he must realize it. He must know it. Okay. Suppose, for example, many people make fun of the beard. Okay. And they say, oh, this is not. You know, this is uh, looks so stupid and whatever. Okay. Well, you go and tell them first of all, your prophet ﷺ had a beard. This is by ijma, by consensus. Whether you say it's fard or wajib or mustahab or whatever, everyone acknowledges the prophet had a beard. When you make fun of the beard, you automatically make fun of the prophet ﷺ. Okay. Secondly, to grow the beard according to the correct opinion is obligatory, as we said. All of the four madhahibs are unanimous on this. Okay. Is that to grow the beard for the men is an obligatory act. It's not something that is just sunnah. It is obligatory for the men to grow beards. Okay. So you have to make sure the brother understands and realizes that. If he realizes it and he, despite that, he makes fun of it, then this is an act of kufr, an act of disbelief. Okay. This is the point of this chapter. How can you make fun of something that Allah has said? How can you make fun of something that the Prophet ﷺ said and did? Anyone who makes fun of it is as if he is making fun of Allah and His Messenger. And we said that certain things, even ignorance is no excuse. To curse Allah and the Messenger, to make fun of Allah, to make fun of Allah's Messenger, to make fun of the Quran, ridicule the Quran, no excuse. You don't, obviously, you don't, you don't have to have knowledge for this type of stuff. Unless the man is insane, obviously. If he is sane, there is no excuse. To make fun of Allah and His Messenger, the punishment is death. You ridicule, you curse Allah and His Messenger, the punishment for that is death. And the scholars say, he who curses Allah's messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it doesn't matter. Obviously, when we're in, when we are in an Islamic state, we're not talking about America or England. Okay, when we're in an Islamic state, it doesn't matter what he does after that. Even if he repents, he is going to be killed. The correct opinion is that a person who curses Allah's messenger and makes fun of Allah's messenger and denigrates the status of Allah's messenger, his punishment is death as soon as he utters that statement. It doesn't matter if he repents after that or not. His repentance is with Allah. We don't care. Our punishment, we are not allowed to forgive that man. We have to kill him as soon as the Islamic State takes hold of him. Okay? And this is not the case in a Kafir country. We don't do this in a non-Muslim country. It's not our right to do it. Okay? So for example, Salman Rushdie. And he clearly makes fun of Allah and his messenger in his book. I've read his book, parts of it. I couldn't read beyond a certain point. But he clearly ridicules Allah's messenger. He clearly ridicules the Prophet's wives. He compares them to prostitutes in his book. Okay? He clearly ridicules Allah's messengers more than the Muhammad. He ridicules uh, Ibrahim. He calls him the bastard, Ibrahim. He says, the bastard, he left his wife and kid. It's exactly what he says. I read it with my own two eyes. Okay? This type of person, if he was in an Islamic state, his punishment is death. No, no, no repentance is accepted from him. If he repents, it's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not our business. This type of person, if we get a hold of him in an Islamic state, once again, so uh, you know, Khomeini's fatwa is not correct. We're not allowed to kill him outside an Islamic state. Okay, this is not our right to do. This is, you know, we leave his state. We, we, we don't do anything to him. Because if we, do, if we were to do so, we would cause more harm to the Muslims. Right? It's not our right to do so. We go and kill him, we're going to cause more harm to the Muslims. 
the gov governments are going to start persecuting us and so on and so forth. But apart from that, if a person like this exists in an Islamic state, no repentance is accepted from him. Even if he sincerely repents, his repentance is with Allah, not with us. We cannot forgive a person who curses Allah's Messenger. And this shows you the love that we have for Allah's Messenger. How about cursing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The scholars say in this case, yes. If he repents and he opens his, declares his repentance, then we say that, okay, your matter is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is this? Are we saying that the Prophet is greater than Allah? No. We are saying that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has an obligation that we have to fulfill. And that is that whoever curses Allah's Messenger, it is not our right to forgive him. Whereas whoever curses Allah, it is Allah's right to forgive him or not. You understand the difference? Allah's Messenger, he is a human being. He is now dead. So this responsibility is now upon us. That whoever curses Allah's Messenger, he is going to be killed whether he repents or not. Whereas someone who curses Allah, then if he repents, if he sincerely repents, right, and we, we think that inshallah he has repented, then we leave him alone. We don't, we don't kill him. Obviously if we catch him and he is cursing Allah's, Allah, then we kill him. But if, you, if we catch him after he has repented, okay, after he has repented, he said, no, I, I, mean, I, I made a mistake and this is an act of kufr and I'm now a Muslim, okay, in this case the scholars say we leave him alone if he was cursing Allah. But if he was cursing Allah's Messenger, then it is not our right, it is not our privilege to forgive him. The Prophet has passed away, he is dead now. So we leave his matter to Allah and we execute him immediately. Okay? So the point is, what is the point of this chapter? To ridicule Allah, to ridicule his Messenger, to ridicule the Sahaba even, by the way. To ridicule the Sahaba. To ridicule anything that is Islamic, this is an act of kufr. This is an act of disbelief and a person must repent for what he has stated. Now. Read the whole uh, the hadith long, the ayah and the hadith both, the whole chapter basically. Allah the Most Exalted said, If you ask them, they declare we were only talking idly and joking. Say, was it at Allah and his ayah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you were mocking? Ibn Umar, Muhammad bin Kaab, Zayd ibn Aslam and Qadada narrated the following hadith. In the course of the campaign of the Battle of Tabuk, a man came up one day and declared, We have seen no people with greater appetite, more lying, more cowardly in battle than those people. He meant Allah's Messenger وسلم, and his companions. Auf bin Malik rose and said, In fact, you are the liar and a hypocrite. And I will inform Allah's Messenger وسلم, about your words. So he went to Allah's Messenger, وسلم, but by then he was already informed through a revelation. Meanwhile, the hypocrite also approached Allah's Messenger وسلم, when he started journey and was already on his camel. He pleaded, O Messenger of Allah, we were only joking and trying to pass the time while traveling. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said that if I see him that he was clinging to the saddle belt of the Messenger of Allah's camel as it ran and his legs were being battered by the rough ground and even then he continued pleading. Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, Was it at Allah and his ayah and his Messenger that you were mocking? Make no excuse, you have disbelieved after you had believed. Neither he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, looked towards him, nor he spoke anything further. Tayyib, hand me the book. In this uh, hadith, which is a very strong hadith, right? During the battle of Tabuk, during the battle of Tabuk, which occurred, uh, I think in the 8th year of the Prophet, I'm not sure, 8th or ninth, right? But ba basically, during this battle, a large group of munafiqun, were accompanying the Muslims, okay, the hypocrites, they were accompanying the Muslims in this battle, okay, so there was a person of these hypocrites, he said, I have not seen any of our reciters, who, who does he mean by the reciters, actually the translation deleted that, the translation deleted that, but what, what he is saying is we have not seen the rec our reciters, meaning the reciters of the Quran, meaning the Prophet and his messengers, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So this munafiq is talking about the Prophet ﷺ and the, and the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And this shows you, by the way, that to make fun of the companions is also a type of disbelief. So imagine the Shi'as of our time who actually consider them kafirs. Okay? Ibn Taymiyyah says in, in, in one of his books that, this is a footnote, footnote mode, he says, whoever, whoever is in doubt as to the disbelief of the Shi'as who claim that uh, the, the Sahaba or Kuffar, then he himself uh, should doubt uh, his iman. Basically, a person who is in doubt as to whether the Shi'as are kafirs or not, in the sense that this belief, then that person in and of himself should doubt his own iman. That person is guilty of kufr. If, if this munafiq made fun of the companions, he didn't accuse them of disbelief, he ridiculed them, and the verse was revealed that this 
is an act of kufr, then imagine how greater the act of kufr when you accuse all of the Prophet's companions of becoming kafirs. Okay? We say this aqidah is the aqidah of kufr. We don't say all Shi'as are kafirs. Again, we say this aqidah, this belief is the belief of kufr. To accuse the Prophet's companions of disbelief is a belief of kufr. Tayyib. We move on now, back to the normal mode. We say that this, this munafiq, he said, I have not seen any of our reciters. I have not seen any of our reciters. They are like, they are as fat bellies as them. They, don't, they are not as fat as these people. And they are no one that is greater liars than them. And there are no one that is more cowardly than them when they meet in battlefield. What is he saying? He is saying that the Sahaba and Allah's Messenger have great appetites, huge bellies, okay? And that they are liars and that they are cowards in battle. Now, first of all, is what he said true? Is anything that he said true? The fact that the Prophet and his companions had large bellies? A'udhu Billah. Who, who were the people that used to tie rocks to their stomachs in order to, you know, make them feel that they were full? Remember when Abu Bakr and Umar, they passed by and they had rocks tied to their stomachs. Why would they tie rocks? Because psychologically you feel that you have a full stomach. So your, your pangs of hunger die down. Okay, that's how hungry they were. And they went to the Prophet's house and the Prophet picked his shirt up and they saw that he had two rocks tied to his stomach. In other words, the Prophet was feeling even more hungry than, than they were. Okay? How about the fact that they said that they are more liars than them? What did the Jew, Abdullah ibn Salam, say when he saw the Prophet's face? I knew that this was the face of a one that could never lie. How about the fact that they were the most cowardly in battles? What did the Sahaba say? When the battle became tough, we used to seek protection from Allah's Messenger. We used to go behind Allah's Messenger to seek protection. So the first point that we have to notice, that the munafiqeen are pure, utter liars. Downright filthy lies. No truth to them whatsoever. Secondly, they have the audacity to talk about it and spread these type of lies. And this is the attitude of the hypocrite. What did the Prophet say? That there are three characteristics or the characteristics of the hypocrite. The first one is when he speaks, he lies. إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذِبْ When he speaks, he lies. So the first thing that we notice is that the hypocrite here, whatever his name was, he said the most blatant, the most outrageous lies about Allah and His Messenger. No truth to them whatsoever. Okay? And to our times, we have groups of people, all they do is they spread lies and rumors about the famous du'at of Islam. So-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. No basis to them, but they love to spread it to people more and more. And this is the attitude of the hypocrites. Is that they don't base what they say upon truth, they base it upon lies. Okay? So, Awf ibn Malik, one of the companions, he stood up, he became angry. He said, <coughs> he, first of all, he defended them. He said, you have lied, kazabta. And this shows you that when we hear Allah and His Messenger being defamed, when we hear that the Prophet's companions are being denigrated, the true Muslim has to become angry. He becomes angry. He says, you have lied. What did Awf ibn Malik say? Kazabta, you are a liar. Rather, you are a munafiq. And I will go and inform Allah's Messenger about what you just said. So look at the, the anger and the jealousy that, that overtook this companion. How dare you make these statements of kufr? Rather, I'm going to inform the Prophet about what you just said, so that he knows that you are a munafiq. Okay? So he rushed from his place in the, in the army to the Prophet's horse. And what did he find? He found that Allah had already revealed this. So this shows you, like we said, uh, these type of incidents, they increase your iman. Look at this man. He rushed immediately to inform the Prophet ﷺ, but Allah had already preceded him by his revelation. Before the man could reach the Prophet ﷺ, walk maybe a few minutes, Allah's revelation had already come down through the angel Jibreel. Okay? And Allah had already, had already informed the Prophet ﷺ about these people. So when the news spread in the community that the Qur'an had been revealed regarding this munafiq, right? What did the munafiq do now? This shows you how cowardly they are. Okay? Now, when his plot has been exposed, what he has said has been exposed, he goes to the Prophet ﷺ seeking forgiveness. Why did you do this act in the first place? You know? But when his plot has him exposed, he goes to the Prophet ﷺ seeking his forgiveness. Now the Prophet is riding on his uh, horse or his, uh, his camel. Okay? And he was clinging to the Prophet's saddle. And the Prophet ﷺ would not even turn to look at this person. And that in and of itself is a severe punishment. Shows you how angry the Prophet was. He would not even turn to look at this person or even respond to his existence. So the man kept on clinging to the Prophet's saddle and he's saying, we were only joking. We're only making, we were just passing some time. We didn't really mean it even though he did mean it. But he's now giving a pathetic excuse to the Prophet. 
He's saying we're just passing time. Just like we're going on a journey, we just say some things. We don't really mean it. Okay, we're just trying to cut the time, we're just joking. And this is the shahid, this is the, uh, the point is that he's saying we're just joking. Okay, we didn't really intend it, we were just joking about this type of stuff. Okay, so the Prophet would not even turn to him, he wouldn't even look at him. He wouldn't even acknowledge his existence. And the man is holding on to the Prophet's saddle and being dragged by the Prophet's horse. So that he's being dragged in the sand by the Prophet's horse. Okay, trying to keep up with the Prophet's horse. And the Prophet wasallam is not even giving him, as they say, the time of day. He does not, does not even turn to look at him. And he just recites the verse that was just revealed right now. Have you dared make fun of Allah and His signs and His messenger? You dare to make fun of Allah and His signs? And then Allah says, لا تعتذروا. Don't give your excuses. Don't give these excuses. قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِمَانِكُمْ You have committed kufr after your iman. This is an act of kufr to make fun of Allah and His signs and His messengers. You have committed kufr after you have, after you have accepted iman. The very fact that you made these statements is a statement of kufr. So this is the point of the chapter, is to make fun of Allah, to make fun of Allah's messenger, to make fun of Allah's signs, meaning Allah's verses in the Qur'an, meaning the religion of Allah. Make fun of anything in the religion of Allah is an act of kufr. So many people, they make, they make fun of prayer, they make fun of wudu, they make fun of Islamic punishments, cutting of the hand, the stoning of the adulterer. They don't realize this is an act of kufr. So the first thing you must do is teach these people. Teach them that this is an act of Islam and to make fun of this act is a kufr. Is an act of kufr. And if they persist, then know that these people, like Allah says in the Quran, قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِمَانِكُمْ They have done kufr after they have accepted iman. And the very punishment that the Prophet gave them, not even looking at him, shows you the gravity of his sin. Because you know, in general, when the munafiqeen would come to the Prophet he would accept their excuses. This was the kind nature of the Prophet When the Prophet returned from after the battle of Tabuk, many of the munafiqeen, they didn't go in fighting. When the Prophet returned, all of in and of themselves, the faith that we had there for Salih of it is that it is minor shirk, gave them an excuse. And the Prophet listened to